very common supracondylar fracture with posterior displacement. Uh, undisplaced supracondylar fracture can happen, and it's very uncommon to have supracondylar fracture with anterior displacement. Again, uh, repetition, the anterior humeral line is not crossing the capitulum, and we can see a subtle fracture over there. So there is a posterior dislocation of the uh, supracondylar fracture. Now I will move on to the upper limbs. Shoulder. So this is the normal view of the uh, shoulder. So when we are studying uh, shoulder joints, so uh, this is the humerus, this is the glenoid cavity, this is the clavicle, this is the acromion, and this is the coracoid process. This is the uh, apical oblique view, which is taken by moving the X-ray beam 45 degrees. So why this is modified trauma axial view? Because it helps us during trauma. Here, what are the advantage we are getting? We are getting better picture of the orientation of the uh, bones. And uh, moreover, the, uh, we need not move the patient injured uh, limb much. So this is a modified trauma axial view. So this is an AP view. So uh, what are the uh, checklists we have to see when we are looking at the AP view? First of all, the humeral head position. Humeral head position should be well oriented with the glenoid cavity. It should be well within the cup of the glenoid cavity. If it is lying below the uh, coracoid process, this is the coracoid process. So if it's lying below the coracoid process, that means it is an anterior dislocation. I will come, with, come up with the images shortly. Then comes the humeral head shape. This is the humeral head shape. This is the lesser trochanter. And usually this humeral head is compared with the walking stick appearance. Walking stick, the elderly people, uh, which they take. So it's a round head and there is narrowing of the problem humerus then comes the acromioclavicular uh, joint this should be well oriented the inferior surface of the acromion and clavicular should be well in alignment and the podococlavicular distance this should not be more than 1.3 centimeters so image details similarly when we will study the modified trauma view we have the more or less same orientation just a little different shape Another important view is the lateral scapular view, that is the Y view. Here also the arm did not be moved very much. I have just given briefly how we take the images. So that when in trauma, we cannot move. Uh, it's very important that we do not move the patient arm much because they cannot bear the pain. So it is very important to uh, rule out posterior dislocation of the humerus. Again, the orientation clavicle. Coracoid. Why is it uh, said Y view? Because the this um, uh, coracoid process and acromion process and the scapular blade they look like shape of Y. Okay. So uh, if uh, this is the human uh, glenoid cavity and anyone any experienced eyes also can definitely say this is uh, the modified X-ray view. This one. So that there is anterior dislocation of the humerus. This is the glenoid cavity and this is the humeral head, which are uh, obviously not properly aligned. So if it moves in this direction, it is posterior dislocation. Now, if it comes in this direction, we have to know the anatomy. We have to be oriented with the anatomy to know whether it is posterior or anterior. So this is anterior close to the body. So anterior one second uh, okay sorry for the inconvenience so this is how we can know this entry dislocation now very important now dislocation we can anyway make out the patient comes with a hanging uh, hand which is and uh, not able to move so clinically we can make out there is dislocation the clinician does not send us to know whether is there is a dislocation or not what they want to know is whether there is any other complications associated with the dislocation so there there are multiple complications, but I will just specify the important ones. They are like the most important is the associated fracture of the glenoid ring. Here, maybe the patient has again relocated after the fracture. The patient comes and the humeral head and the glenoid cavity is properly aligned. Okay, but there is a fracture of the inferior glenoid ring. So this is the important uh, complication of the shoulder dislocation. 
there are few deformities associated with anterior dislocation one is the hill sex deformity it is a depression of the humeral head you have to remember h with h humeral head hill sex deformity and another is the bankers deformity which i have shown in a previous case it is the fracture of the uh, inferior rim of the glenoid rim so we have to just uh, imagine the situation when the uh, humerus comes anteriorly it uh, breaks through the glenoid uh, uh, ring and also gets a dent on its head so they most of them they i may be they may occur uh, uh, solo or may occur combined also so this is a case of posterior dislocation the humeral head is uh, dislocated posteriorly so posterior dislocation uh, it's very uh, an important sign is associated with this it's called a light bulb sign so uh, the orientation is when it is a normal uh, uh, position the humeral head is compared to a walking stick there is a bulb like head and uh, uh, it's a round head and the uh, humerus uh, looks more narrowed so this is compared to be uh, to as a walking stick but when there is posterior dislocation the uh, humerus rotates posteriorly the there is one internal rotation also so the humeral head loses this contour of the greater trochanter and it looks like a bulb so here also you can see the orientation more looks uh, okay but the humeral head has lost its contour the humeral head the greater trochanter contour is not well visualized and it looks round and this is the light bulb sign uh, sorry this is the light bulb sun sign it is dislocated posteriorly and then another important is the uh, acromial clavicular uh, 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 ligament tear so uh, many a times the patient will simply complain of pain and we can see simply nothing so uh, we can take what can we do is we can add weight to the wrist and they can take images if this distance increases between the acromion and clavicle it signifies uh, the ligament injury now there are various grading of injury so grade one injury there is just stretching and partial rupture of the acromioclavicular joint ligament but intact codacoclavicular ligament in grade 2 there is rupture there is a rupture of the acromioclavicular joint and stretching of the codacoclavicular ligament and in grade 3 injury there is rupture as well of the acromioclavicular uh, joint ligament as well as the codacoclavicular ligaments so these are the various uh, types of injuries so we can see that the, here there is stretch, stretching of the uh, ligaments of the acromioclavicular joint and there is like great increase in distance su uh, suggesting rupture of the acromioclavicular joint as well as the codacoclavicular ligaments other fractures associated with the uh, um, shoulder joint here it is a greater tuberosity fracture uh, usually the greater tuberosity fracture can be very subtle and can be very easily missed out we have to just clearly um, uh, look out for a, a subtle breach of the cortex over here and subtle lucency at the greater tuberosity here is quite obvious clavicle fracture and this is the impacted fracture of the neck of humerus uh, it is appearing more bright because it is impacted means bone over bone bone is impacting on each other it's rammed together and here we can see the scapular uh, body fracture adult elbow so uh, this is the uh, anatomy so one thing we have to remember that the uh, this is the capitulum of the uh, uh, trochlea uh, this is uh, capitulum of the uh, distal humerus and it is oriented with the radial head and the trochlea that is oriented with the codacoid process of the ulna. In lateral view, again, this uh, radial head is oriented with the capitulum, and this is the uh, olecranon. I will get onto this anatomy in just a while. So there are a few important uh, helpers when the elbow anatomy is uh, elbow uh, uh, pathologies are concerned. One of our friend is that elbow fat pads. So we have to know that uh, we have 
two fat pads around the elbow joint. One is the anterior fat pad. This is subtle uh, fat, which is anterior to the elbow. And another posterior fat pad, which lies in the olecranon groove and it is not seen normally. And this is the normal synovium. So this is a normal elbow joint. And we can see a thin lucency. Lucency means dark. Fat appears dark in x-rays. So this is a thin lucency. Sorry. Thin lucency around the anterior plane. And posterior we can see. So when there, whenever there is synovial hypertrophy or effusion, this anterior fat prints, this uh, raises up like this. And the posterior one, this is also raising up. So this is, in this, when the fat is displaced anterior, this is the anterior fat pad. And when we can see a sail-like sign, it is uh, more volume to the, uh, to the uh, anterior fat pad. It is called sail sign. And here also we can see clearly this is the anterior fat pad which is displaced. And this is the posterior fat pad, this is displaced. So the rule is that if the anterior fat pad is displaced, there could be a fracture. It could be. But if the posterior is displaced, there is probably a fracture. I mean, it more it is more specific for a pathology. And if uh, fat pads are not displaced, then it's really a fracture. So we have to be very... Uh, very uh, conscious about the fat pads here also there was one sale sign and no fracture was with this only uh, no of this we can see here also there is subtle break in the radial head but when we took other angle projection this uh, radial head and neck fracture was more obvious this patient is this one so this uh, elbow fat pads raise suspicion of any pathology around the elbow joint now there are few lines. The, this is called radiocapitular line. The uh, line uh, traveling through the proximal part of the radial neck should cross the capitulum. This is called radiocapitular line. In case of anterior dislocation, this line does not pass through the capitulum. And we call it anterior dislocation of the radial head. We have to uh, again remember that usually this uh, pathology, radial head uh, dislocation are uh, accompanied with other fractures. In this case, this is Montagia fracture. What is that? There is fracture of mid shaft of the ulna and with associated radial uh, head anterior dislocation. So this is Montagia fracture. So whenever we uh, like seeing, this is like very obvious fracture, but many a times these fractures are not very obvious. So we should have a high uh, degree of suspicion. If we see one of the fracture, we should try and look for the other fracture also. Pediatric elbow. So again, this fat pads come into the, uh, uh, they are helping us. Uh, the anterior fat pad, posterior fat pads, if they are displaced, this, they're both posterior fat and anterior fat pads and displays, and this signifies injury, first of all. So another important point in pediatric, uh, radio, uh, pediatric elbow is the uh, appearance of ossification center. So there is an order in which the ossification center around the elbow, they appear. It is called crito. Crito means first the, the capitulum arises then comes the radial head, then comes the medial or internal epicondyle, then comes the trochlea, and then uh, olecranon prosphosa, and then the lateral epicondyle. This is the lateral view. Again, the same, uh, we can see the same uh, ossification center. This is the olecranon, which is not well visualized in the epi view, and we take the lateral view for better visualization of the olecranon process. So I have taken some normal x-rays here, uh, a small child. Here, uh, only the capitulum can be seen. Then comes the radial head capitulum and radial head. Here we can see the capitulum, radial head, and the medial epicondyle. Here we can see the trochlea also. Trochlea also. Here we can see the olecranon process. And here, last, the lateral epicondyle has also uh, opacified. So 97% this crito order is followed. 
three person may show a slightly different order but which one the thing which is very important that there is no instant in which the trochlear ossification center has appeared before the medial epicondyle center so if we see that there is a opacity of trochlea and we are not able to see the medial epicondyle that signifies there is an avulsion fracture of the medial epicondyle so these are the uh, few of x-rays uh, this is like a di diaphragmatic diagrammatic representation uh, this one is normal there is slight avulsion of the medial epicondyle then there comes a major avulsion and there is a major avulsion and the epicondyle is lying within the joint so we can see the images also here it is normal there is mild avulsion more avulsion and here we can see the uh, medial epicondyle lying here and we can see that the trochlea is al already there so if like we can see the trochlea and this we are not seeing so uh, if we see this x-ray just this x-ray this is a trochlea there here there is no medial epicondyle then we have to know that there is a fracture In no case that the trochlea has appeared and the medial epicondyle has not appeared this cannot happen then uh, important lines one is the radio capital line this i have described just uh, in adult uh, uh, x-ray also the line passing through the proximal part of the radial neck should pass through the capitulum like this here also like this if it's not passing through there that means there is some abnormality there is some dislocation and another is the anterior humeral line if we uh, pass a line through the anterior margin of the humerus it should cut one third process uh, portion of the capitulum this is called as the anterior humeral line so here this is a patient we, if we follow the anterior humeral line like this it's a pediatric patient it is not crossing the one third of the capitulum and we can suspect there is some uh, injury uh, uh, and uh, here also uh, i'm not taking good images here um, some uh, here the it, it is wrongly mentioned it it is uh, the radio capitulum line uh, proximal uh, this if a line passes through the proximal part of radius it should cross the uh, capitulum here we can see that it is not crossing the capitulum we should not take the full radius we should not take the line from the shaft of the radius no we have to take it there is a normal angulation of the radial neck so we have take have to take the line along the proximal part of the radial neck so like this so it should cross the capitulum and this is not crossing so there is some dislocation also also uh, so there is a dislocation and there is subtle fracture also in the ulna so this is a montagia fracture so whenever we find one fracture we should be looking for other associated fracture few things are like obvious but as a radiologist is our work to look for other unobvious thing and the uh, supracondylar fracture is like very most common fracture in children about 60% of the children which come to the emergency department with uh, uh, pathological elbow or in fall in the elbow they have supracondylar fracture so again we can see uh, uh, it's a diag diagrammatic representation that the humeral uh, line is displaced uh, very common supracondylar fracture with posterior displacement uh, undisplaced supracondylar fracture can happen and it's very uncommon to have supracondylar fracture with anterior displacement again uh, repetition the anterior humeral line is not crossing the capitulum and we can see a subtle fracture over there so there is a posterior dislocation of the uh, supracondylar fracture here again we can see there is anterior fat planes posterior fat planes there is posterior uh, tilt and the anterior humeral line is not crossing the capitulum so there is a supracondylar fracture with posterior displacement and this uh, fat planes are uh, anterior and posterior fat planes are displaced wrist and forearm uh, too many complicated too many bones are in the wrist these are the carpal bones the most important carpal bone for us is the radius the lunate 
the capitulum. So this is when we take a look in the lateral image, we have to remember that the radius, the unit and capitulum should come in a line like a plate, a saucer, a cup and an apple over there. And another thing is that uh, many a times there is mild and tilt of the lunet over the radius. So the most common fractures around bridge joint are uh, very young, green stick or stodas, older children. Uh, there can be um, salter hennies. Salter hennies fracture are not specific for the wrist. It can happen anywhere. Young adults, they can have scapoid or tricuteral fracture, middle-aged polys and elderly also polys. So a uh, torus fracture and green stick fracture. So we have to know that a child has very pliable bones. Their ligaments are stronger, but their bones are very pliable, very soft. In adults, the uh, um, Bones are relatively brittle and they get more ligament injury. But in children, they have very soft bones. They usually bend and break. So green stick fracture, when there is a slight bend in the bone, it is called green stick. Or there can be a slight buckling of the bone. It is called torus fracture. In adults, there is a break in the cortex. We see at loosens, loosened line, they get displaced. But in children, they usually become bent. They get bent. So when there is a bend, we call it green stick fracture. Green stick as compared with the green twig. Whenever a young branch of the tree is uh, tried to be broken, it does not break easily. It becomes, it bends. So that's why it's green stick fracture. And torus fracture is slight buckling of bones. Salter Harris fracture is an important fracture. It signifies any fracture around the epiphysis. It's not specific for the wrist joint. So it's very important to have to know the classification of the salter Harris fracture. So, so uh, it's normal. It's like everything's normal. Type 1. The mnemonic for this uh, type of fracture is lies in the name Salter only. Type 1 is like separated, widely separated physis. Type 2 above the growth growth rate separated and it travels above the growth phase into the uh, diaphysis metaphysis and then uh, type 3 it goes below the growth plate uh, then type 4 through the growth plate it uh, travels all across and last is uh, e is uh, it's rammed together they got get impacted so salter head is type fracture so I will just not go to much depth over here. Uh, then I will go through a few of the important carpal bone fractures around wrist joint. The most important bone to be fractured around wrist is the scaphoid fracture. So there are various views for the scaphoid fracture. I have just given an image for an uh, idea. I have not gone much into it. The thing to be noted that uh, scaphoid fracture is very prone for AVN. Um, a vascular necrosis. So uh, <clears throat> the most common uh, 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 fracture is around the waist and uh, least common is the proximal bone. But if there is a fracture of the proximal bone, it has it is most prone for the avian. We have to remember that the scaphoid derives its blood supply from its distal bone. So its blood supply comes from its distal bone and then uh, reaches is the proximal bone. So if there is mm, a fracture uh, uh, of the proximal bone, it is quite prone for uh, a vascular necrosis. This is the waist fracture. This is the waist fracture. This is the distal pole fracture. So if there is a proximal uh, pole fracture, risk of avian is very high. If there is a distal pole fracture, the risk of avian is nil and waste also high. So since this uh, uh, bone is quite prone for avascular necrosis, it requires instant intervention if uh, known. And hence, it's very important that we pick up this fracture uh, right away. Two fractures, not very common, but very important to, uh, 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 I mention it here. First is a tri tricuteral fracture. 
it is important uh, radiologically important because it is the only bone which displaces posteriorly if we see a picture like this with a fragment of bone lying posterior to the wrist this is the lunate it is tilting um, to the anterior side so we know that this is the front and this is the back the fingers are facing this side so this is the posterior aspect and a fragment of lying going um, posteriorly suggests tricotral fracture and this is a hamid fracture the person banged his hand in a wall not very common but we can have a look at it two signs perithomas sign it uh, it is uh, specific for scaphoid lunate separation so who was terry thomas terry thomas was a comedian with a large gap in between its upper incisors so whenever it's a, a scaphoid lunate separation uh, that's a ligament connecting the scaphoid and lunate when this gets ruptured there is a gap over here this is the scaphoid bone this is the lunate bone and there is a gap so it is compared with the um, uh, upper incisor gap of terry thomas so terry thomas sign scaphoid lunate separation so maybe a multiple choice question view in the practical view not very much important few more name uh, pathologies lunate dislocation uh, this is the uh, radius and this is the lunate bone so the lunate goes in front this uh, uh, capitate and radius uh, they are in line but this lunate comes up the saucer and the apple are aligned but the cup moves forward this is lunate dislocation perilunate dislocation the lunate and the radius are in line but this apple is going posteriorly capitate is moving posteriorly perilunate dislocation this radius and lunate are aligned but this capitate along with the rest of the wrist are moving backwards this is perilunate dislocation and this lunate dislocation in pa view looks like triangle so this is uh, uh, lunate dislocation so uh, this is the barton fracture this is a uh, fracture of distal radius involving the um, uh, articular surface and reverse barton or volar barton fracture uh, this name things are good for mcqs if you want to know otherwise whenever there is radiological uh, explanation we just explain and leave the um, clinicians whatever name they want to put otherwise just for mcq push part fracture of distal radius extending to articular volar fracture a uh, button fracture and if there is reverse button towards the anterior part volar part then this is volar button fracture green stick fracture uh, whenever there is an attack and the patient tries to uh, uh, avoid the uh, hit hitting on the face so there is an uh, solo uh, only one uh, unlace involved so this is the night stick fracture and this is colis fracture distal radius fracture along with the uh, ulnar stalot uh, fracture galizi fracture there is a fracture of the radius mid shaft along with dislocation of the uh, 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 ulnar uh, joint radio ulnar joint this is the galizia fracture and last but not the least uh, this is the this is normal extend this is for the viewers to pick what is the fracture where is the abnormality can anybody pick so we can see there is subtle density over the distal radius okay this is impacted fracture very subtle we have to have a high level of suspicion the patient complains with pain in wrist and we can see a density many a times the radiologist may miss this sort of fracture they don't have the history they will just have they will look around everywhere but it is it's important that we have a proper history and a higher level of suspicion to pick such type of subtle impacted fracture again a child with pain in wrist can everybody pick where is the problem or is it normal subtle loosened line subtle buckling of the 
cortex. This is torus fracture. So again, high level of suspicion is must. A radiologist without any history may, dis uh, may miss all this diagnosis. So history is very important for us. Hands and fingers, I will go to it briefly. Uh, this is the lots of ligaments. Uh, the main important ligaments around the fingers are the medial collateral ligament, lateral collateral ligament. And uh, there are there is a volar plate around the uh, anterior surface of the fingers and these are the extensor tendon. So first of all, the Bennett's fracture, which is the fracture involving the proximal first metacarpal Bennett fracture and uh, the larger metacarpal, uh, metacarpal fragment is pulled dorsally and radially by the abductor pollicis longus muscle so this there is a fracture around this and the deep ulnar ligament holds the uh, proximal part of the uh, uh, first metacarpal and the, the distal pull of the um, uh, rest of the distal fragment and Rolando fracture is the comminuted intraarticular fracture of the base of first metacarpal and it extends intraarticularly. So, Rolando fracture. These are important uh, name fractures, that's why I have included. These are quite rare fractures and name doesn't matter also, but anyhow, to, uh, it would be good for MCQs. Bennett fractures, uh, proximal first metacarpal uh, fracture, and Ronaldo. Uh, involves intraarticularly or this comminuted fracture involving intraarticularis. The more name fractures, mallet fracture, when there is avulsion of the extensor tendon, there is a permanent flexion of the uh, distal most phalanx. And this is volar plate fracture. When there is force extension, the volar plate gets avulsed. So there is a volar plate fracture. Boxer's fractures. There is a fracture of the uh, distal uh, neck of uh, metacarpal. But uh, usually, a brain boxer do not have this sort of uh, fracture. It's a misnomer. Most of the time, these fractures are for the street fighters, night fighters. We find sort of boxers fighters fracture of the uh, distal metacarpal head. Another spear's thumb. Here, there is uh, the medial collateral ligament is torn and standard radio, uh, uh, and the standard radiographic appearance is normal. Uh, there is a medial collateral ligament if it's torn. Uh, here, in this case, if it's the collateral ligament is, is torn, it may appear normal in the X-ray. However, if there is an evolution fracture uh, of the um, uh, base of the uh, proximal phalanx, uh, we can see it as like this, an Abel's fracture. This is the skier's thumb skier's thumb this is more common in the skiers and when they fall therefore the thumb is opposed with the ski skiing rod and they get such a such type of uh, fractures and that's why the name the skier's thumb and this is the last point. okay last but not the least uh, there are multiple uh, ligaments which holds the carpal and metacarpal joints. The one thing I have, we have to remember, there are lots of arrangement how we can see this joint, but one thing is constant. This uh, fourth and fifth uh, metacarpal have a, a zigzag pattern of uh, zigzag pattern in between them. The, the line goes zigzag. This is constant. And raise the first, second and third, they can have varied pattern. So varied pattern. So if we have loss of this zigzag pattern which we call the light of day we have to look more carefully and we can see a proximal metacarpal fracture fifth metacarpal fracture and more fractures spiral fractures in fingers through the uh, articular surface so whenever we have to uh, describe a fracture we it's very important to know whether it's the fracture is traveling into the joint space because that uh, the clinician would be knowing which type of intervention they are planning so that's all thank you uh, the details were intricate the images were very good and uh, i hope that everyone will benefit from this uh, video thank you thank, thank you for your time